Amen. We praise the Lamb of God, beloved, for being able to come to you today in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Dr. Lyle Lee. We want to talk today about the kingdom of heaven. Now, there are three manifestations of the kingdom of God and three dispensations, as well as three different names. We understand that it is the one kingdom Christ focused on in all of his parables. But we must be able to break down the three dispensations and the three different manifestations of each dispensation for the kingdom, or we'll never comprehend it. First of all, let me say, is in the New Testament, we find the Apostle Paul teaches about the kingdom of God. If we read it from Galatians, Ephesians, or Colossians, the kingdom of Christ, or from Matthew, the kingdom of heaven. So we find that it has three names, but it's the one kingdom that we refer to. So whether we call it the kingdom of Christ or the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, it's the one kingdom that we are talking about. You must establish this understanding in your theology. You must establish that the kingdom is one, but the names are three different names for that one kingdom. It doesn't mean that if I call it the kingdom of heaven, that it's a different dispensation. No, beloved. It's the one kingdom in every dispensation called by three names. Now, the word dispensation means something with a time. It has a beginning and an end. So it, it's a, a period of time with a beginning and an end. In this case, the first dispensation of the kingdom of heaven came when Jesus Christ died on the cross, and then the kingdom of heaven will end at the second coming of Christ. Now we know this when Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 3 to 5, No man can see the kingdom, and no man can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born again. The point is, you could not get born again unless Christ had died on the cross. So as soon as the thief said, I believe in you, Lord Jesus, I believe in you, remember me, and Christ said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And so salvation and entrance into the kingdom happened from the time of Christ's death burial and resurrection. And we want to pinpoint that as our beginning of the kingdom of God. And so as we study the scriptures, then the dispensation begins there, but according to Luke chapter 19, or Luke 12 verse 19, it ends at the second coming of Christ. And this is repeated also in Matthew 25 from verses 14 to 30. It's repeated if we look at the parable of the talents. So it states there that a, a nobleman went away into a far country. And of course, Christ went into the third heaven. That's the far country to receive the next dispensation of the kingdom. So at his second coming, he will come back with another kingdom of heaven. So that particular kingdom of heaven is called a 1,000-year millennial kingdom of heaven. So the dispensation is 1,000 years. Now, it starts at the second coming of Christ, and it ends 1,000 years later. Then the third dispensation of the kingdom of heaven is called the New Jerusalem. This is a city of God found in Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 when we start the new heaven and new earth. And it has a beginning, which is at the end of the millennium, but there does not appear to be an end. So let me state again the three dispensations, and then we'll talk about the manifestations. The first dispensation of the kingdom of heaven came through Christ's death, burial, resurrection. It ends at his second coming. 
That is a dispensation. The second dispensation begins at the second coming and ends 1,000 years later. This is called the Millennial Kingdom of Heaven. The third dispensation begins after the millennium is over when we start the new heaven and new earth and then it continues throughout eternity. That's the final dispensation of the kingdom of God. And so we realize in manifestations, there are three manifestations. During the first dispensation, which is the time that we are in today, the kingdom of heaven is here today. And the manifestation of the kingdom is within our heart. This is what Christ taught in Luke 17, verse number 20, 21. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. It's in the heart of each believer. And each believer is in the kingdom. Not only is the kingdom in you, but you are in the kingdom. And so all parables must be broken down in the theology of the dispensation and the manifestation when we are talking about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of heaven. Then the second manifestation, the millennial kingdom of heaven, that's the second dispensation, and the second manifestation is no longer inwardly, it is now outwardly. We find that in Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. The kingdom of God then becomes a government, and the government rests upon the shoulders of Christ. And this is repeated as you read it throughout Revelation, but especially, I think, in Revelation 15, when we start to study that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of Christ. And we realize that the kingdom of heaven, amen, the manifestation will not only be inwardly, it will be outwardly. Then when that kingdom of heaven ends, we enter into the next and final dispensation of the kingdom of heaven, which is now a city called New Jerusalem. Now, if you can comprehend what I've stated thus far, then you will understand that the parables explain two kingdoms of heaven. All the parables are about the kingdom of God. Every parable you read about is, is about the kingdom of God. And it explains two different dispensations, the one that we are in today and the millennial kingdom of heaven. All right, so it depends which parable we're reading and how it breaks down to explain the kingdom of God to us. So then we'll understand which manifestation and which dispensation that particular parable is for. An example, when you read Matthew chapter 13, you'll find there seven dispensations or seven parables about the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of heaven is explained in seven parables. The dispensations need to be understood that either we are talking about the kingdom of heaven today that we are in, or we're talking about the kingdom of heaven at the second coming of Christ called the millennium. So when you read the first parable of the sower and the seed, for an example, it tells us that in the kingdom of God today, the manifestation is that the kingdom of heaven is in our heart. The kingdom of God has four types of Christians. Those inside the kingdom that have believed Jesus Christ died for their sin are explained as the type of heart that's very hard, like concrete. These types of Christians believe Jesus died for their sin, but there is no transformation in their character. They still live according to their sinful lifestyle as if they never got saved. You will find no change in their character. So the ground is completely hard, no seed can be sown and nothing can grow. So there is no change in the character. The second type of heart explained in the parable of the sower 
is the, the ground that actually has a bed of stones. So you see, instead of having a completely hard ground, the person has dealt with certain sins. Maybe they dealt with being an adulterer, a drug addict, a homosexual. They dealt with particular sins that are very bad, lesbianism or murder. They dealt with sins that are outwardly abominable to a lot of people. And they're not doing that anymore. So there is a change in the heart. There is a change in the character of the person. But yet they have a bed of stones. There are certain sins they'll never give up. They're not at the place yet. They haven't made a transition. So there are certain sins that they like to do. Perhaps they like bingo. They like smoking. Uh, they've been delivered from drugs. They're not doing that anymore. They're not an alcoholic anymore, but they're not going to give up their cigarettes. They're still uh, gambling. They're still doing other types of sins that are smaller. And then the third heart in the kingdom, Christ explained, are those that got rid of their sinful lifestyle, but all they really care about is to become rich. It's called the thorns. They only want to be rich, wealthy, a bigger house, better cars, uh, fame and fortune is what they're after. They are not really after the salvation of people. They don't really care if people go to hell or people go to heaven. They're not interested. They are dealing with their own lives. They got their life as holy as they think it should be. They don't really have a bed of stones, so they've, they've moved on to a better position where their character has changed, but still they're useless. They're not producing any fruit. The fourth kind of Christian that we talk about is the one that produces fruit on good ground. And so you'll find in every church denomination these types of Christians. It doesn't matter if you're in Pentecostal or Catholic or Protestant or Anglican or Baptist or Methodist, four square, and the list goes on and on and on. It wouldn't matter what church you belong to, but you've got to understand this is how Christ spoke about his church. And every parable in metaphors speaks of either God the Father God the Son, or the church. And if you don't understand that, you will not be able to break down the parables. The parable of the sower is about the Son of God. He's the sower. He's a preacher. And he goes and sows the word. That's the Bible. And the seed falls on different hearts. And then we have another parable listed there called the tares and the wheat. Now that particular parable is about the millennial kingdom of heaven. That's not even about this dispensation. That's about the millennium, when the tares and the wheat grow together. When the children of God that had glorified bodies, they come back to rule the earth, and they'll rule over the unsaved, the tares, and they'll be in that millennial kingdom. And the tares and the wheat will grow together. And then we find at the end of that kingdom, then what happens is the tares are gathered and they're burned at the end of the millennium. They go from there to the white throne judgment and then they go to the lake of fire. It's very simple to interpret. The tares and the wheat parable is not about the kingdom of God today. But we understand there is a parable there which I am partial with. And that's uh, Matthew 13, verse 31 and 32. When we talk about the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man. And this man took a mustard seed and he put it into the ground. The seed died. It produced a tree known as the mustard tree. And then the fowls of the heaven lodged in the branches of the tree. Now, I am very partial with this particular parable because it explains in metaphors, the Father or God, he took the Son of God. Jesus Christ is called the mustard seed. Now the Father takes the mustard seed, which is the Son of God, puts him in the earth and he dies. And as Christ dies, the mustard seed produces the mustard tree, which is the church. So in this parable we have in metaphors the Father, the Son, and the church. And all parables are based on the Father, the Son, and the church. 
So in metaphors, you can interpret every parable in this understanding, in this light. So as we study the parables, we understand, and this is very important for those of you that are seeking power and authority, you must learn this parable. The Father took the Son. He is the least of all human beings. Christ explained the parable as the mustard seed is the least of all seeds. The word seed in the parable means a human being. That's why Jesus Christ is called the seed of Abraham. He's called the seed of the woman, an example in Genesis 3.15. He's called the seed of David. See, he's given the name seed various times, which refers to him as a human being. So in his parable, the mustard seed, which is a metaphor, is about Jesus, and it's the least of all seeds. In other words, Christ is the least of all human beings, the most humblest. Nobody emptied themselves out like the Master. Not my will, but thine be done. And so if you can comprehend the mustard seed, that's very important that you understand it's the greatest faith there is in the Bible, is when a man stops living for himself and only lives for God. Only want to please the master. That's the greatest faith there is. When you humble yourself, you, you decreased, he increases. Because in all reality, the Lord said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, so if you can do what he did, you empty yourself out, then God becomes great in your life. You do the will of the Father. You'll say to a mountain, move, and that mountain will obey you. So if I speak to cancer, AIDS, disease, sickness, death, and I tell it to move, as long as I am obedient, I've submitted to God, emptied myself out like Jesus, then the manifestation will take place. The healing, the miracle will manifest. And so we realize this is how the kingdom of heaven operates on the earth. Then, as the mustard seed died, it brought forth the mustard tree. Now, that is the church. And in metaphors, the word mustard is really an herb. And I want you to know, in metaphors, herbs represent suffering. Now, Christ was born to suffer. And the church also is in adversity. We are created and born here to suffer. Just read Philippians 1.29. It's appointed unto every Christian to suffer for God or to suffer for Christ. And so we are in this parable, in this metaphor, the mustard tree. And so we suffer when we live holy, when we preach about repentance, when we preach about sin, and people don't like it and they persecute us. But the amazing thing is that when the mustard tree grows up, although it remains as one trunk coming out of the ground, it has many branches. Therefore, in all denominations, you'll find one trunk. We all believe one thing. Doesn't matter if you go to the Catholic Church or the Pentecostal, the Protestant, or the Baptist. We all believe one thing in Christianity. That is the death, burial, and resurrection. We all believe the same thing. Jesus was born by a virgin. All right? So it doesn't matter which mainline church you walk into. It's all identical. But then the mustard tree has branches, and those branches are denominations. And so Christ knew from the very beginning that we would end up in denominations. In the parable, once the tree forms the branches, then the birds will lodge in the branches of the tree. Meaning, in the kingdom of heaven today, we have seducing spirits and doctrines of devils in all denominations. From every pulpit, and it doesn't matter which church we belong to, and I am not putting the churches down, but we must understand there will be false teaching along with the true teachings. And that's just the reality that Christ taught. Now, I'm not promoting one church above another. I'm just stating the fact. The parable is self-explanatory. As the Bible interprets itself, when you read Matthew 13 the sower and the seed, the fowl come and take 
the seed that fell on the hard ground. And Jesus, in his interpretation, said, the birds are devils. And so the same thing applies in, the, in Matthew 13. In verses there, when we read 31, 32, the fowls lodge in the branches of the tree, which is the kingdom of heaven, or the church. And so devils are definitely behind pulpits, or some sermons that are being preached are from seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And so this is how the kingdom of heaven is broken up by the master. And we must accept the truth of the word of God, beloved. Now I realize that the kingdom of heaven that we are in today is going to end. But study Matthew 13 and you'll get a greater knowledge of the kingdom of God. An example, when we study Matthew 18, Matthew 22, Matthew 25, you know, we can read about the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is explained about, um, if we take Matthew 25, for example, we have three parables there. From verses 1 to 13, we study about the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. From verses 14 to 30, we study about the parable of the talents. And from verses 31 to 46, we study about the kingdom of heaven as likened unto sheep and goats. And so we realize those kingdom of heavens in their dispensations and their manifestations help us to comprehend more what the church is like today and in the millennium. Because the first kingdom of heaven in Matthew 25 is the wise virgins and foolish virgins. And in every church you go to, you will find people that don't serve the Lord and people that love the Lord. People that will make it into the rapture and those that won't. They believe in Christ. They believe He died for their sin, but they don't have oil in their lamp and they walk in darkness. That's reality. Then when we look at the next parable in Matthew uh, 25 verses 14 to 30, the parable of the talents, there are only two people working and the other one is not working. And so many people in the kingdom of heaven today are not laboring. And there are two thirds that might be laboring. And yet there are those that refuse to labor. Now their judgment will come as it states there on the judgment day. But until then, they'll keep their talent because the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Then the final kingdom of heaven explained there from verses 31 to 46 is the sheep and the goat. And of course, all throughout the millennial kingdom, you will find the sheep and the goat. And then at the end of the millennium, they'll take the goats and they'll go into the lake of fire while the sheep will enter into the final kingdom of heaven. Now, I could go on and on about that kingdom of heaven, but I want to talk about something Paul said. It's written in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10. It's rewritten in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. And it's written a third time in Ephesians 5, verses 3 to 5. And so it doesn't matter where we turn in our Bible. Three different times Paul wrote about it. And I want to specify that Paul said here, an example, I'm just going to turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if we read it from 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, or Ephesians 5, 3 to 5, it's all about inheriting a kingdom. Now this kingdom that we are in today, we've already entered it when we got born again. As it says in Colossians 1, 13, you were translated into the kingdom when you were born again. But the warning for all Christians that will commit these 17 sins or that will live carnal, the warning is that they cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 
So therefore, Paul is telling Christians and warning Christians all throughout the New Testament in different churches, in different epistles, that if you sin against God and live a carnal lifestyle, you will not make it into the next kingdom of heaven. See, this one you do not inherit. You're already in it. But the next one you must inherit it. You're not in it yet. So please understand, beloved, that the next kingdom of heaven is what the warning is all about for Christians. It's not about going to hell. It's not about sinning and going to hell. Because no Christian can get born again again. When we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all sin. So let me state this. In Revelation 22, one of the greatest mysteries about the kingdom. When the final kingdom of heaven begins, the city New Jerusalem, it states in Revelation 22, verse number 14 and 15, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. This is the final kingdom, New Jerusalem. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. The mystery, it's about the kingdom, beloved. Remember Paul said to Christians, if you don't live holy, you won't make it into the kingdom. You won't inherit it. And then we turn and we find in Revelation 22, as the book is closing, it states here, only those that kept the commandments as Christians got into the city. And yet, all the sinners and the demons that went from hell to the lake of fire are not on the earth. They're in a lake of fire. Now, I don't know where that is, but it's not on the earth. So we must realize that when this final manifestation and dispensation of the kingdom, this city of God, comes down, Inside are those that kept the commandments of Christ, but outside are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, and liars. Liars are out there. They can't get into the kingdom of heaven as a liar. Now remember this. These people did not go to the lake of fire. They're on the earth for all eternity now. But look at the judgment. They never made it into the kingdom. God's will is for you and I to make it into the joy of the Lord as we serve God. To make it into the kingdom of heaven. That's the will of God, beloved. Now you're in it today. And you must study the parables to help you to illuminate your mind concerning the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of heaven. You're in it today, but will you get in it tomorrow? Will you make it into the millennial kingdom? Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to serve the Lord, live holy, carry a cross every day? Are you willing to lay your life down, serve the Lord, keep the commandments, practice the doctrines of the New Testament? That's the requirement to make it into the next kingdom. Jesus stated in closing, in Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone that calls me Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom. You're in this one today from calling Jesus Lord. You got into this one. But will you get into the next one? Will you get into the millennial kingdom? Will you get into the final kingdom of heaven? The city of God? You think about it, beloved. The grace of God be with you as you study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. I'm Dr. Lyle Lee. God ever grant you grace to find out his will in this great mystery of the kingdom of heaven.